thank you uh, thank you for this uh, invitation it's uh, it's nice to see an audience uh, you know who want to listen to something on a saturday morning so it's not it's not usual you know because these days uh, with the pandemic people don't come for regular classes on regular days so i'm happy to see that uh, there's a sizable audience uh, and, and hopefully you know i'll leave you with something that you can take away from this lecture uh, so just so i get something have uh, is anybody in the audience i mean i'm not asking the faculty of course because they obviously will know what i'm going to talk about but among the students uh, have you people seen anything on ramsey theory are you exposed to any of this before or uh, is it is it completely i mean is it is anything about this familiar or or no no sir no okay so uh, just so I, i also know my audience uh, among the students we have bachelors as well as master students or also phd i mean can i know what is the composition of the audience as such Do we have bachelor students also in the audience? BSc Mathematics or BSc Statistics or MSc Maths student. MSc Maths students. Okay, there are BSc Maths. So okay, uh, any PhD students there? Or... No. No. The reason I'm asking is, you know, it it will help me to, you know, design at what level I can pitch my talk. But okay, since you basically it's largely msc students and some bsc students maybe uh and if if i'm saying something that you don't quite understand please feel free to you know stop me and ask me if you have any questions uh because ramsey theory as such is a is a topic of uh, for a lot of current research interest it is a very hot topic in some sense and it is also a little difficult i mean and maybe as i present things to you you will get an idea of what is difficult why it is difficult and also what exactly is it about this theory that makes it so fascinating okay uh to to do this what i will the way i will go about is uh, instead of doing things uh, the usual way where i tell you the definitions and so on i'll first tell you the statements of three problems i i think i'd said two in my uh my abstract Actually, I should have said three. See, the first of those three problems is a bit of a is like a recreational problem. I won't call it recreational, but it is not a very deep question. It is just a weird kind of question if you have never seen that sort of thing before. The other two are historically well studied ones, and uh, in some sense, both of them are responsible for the birth of Ramsey theory as we understand it today. So. let me do this i will turn off my video so that then i can start doing the writing uh okay so so to tell you what as i said to give you a motivation of where i'm going or what exactly uh ramsey theory is all about and so on i wish to do it as i said by first telling you three problems so uh let me put down three problems is it uh, visible enough or in yes, my as my handwriting legible i mean i don't want yeah okay all right so here is the first question show that there exists an infinite set of naturals such that for all a b in a a not equal to b a plus b has an even number of prime factors and here i mean even number of prime factors i mean not counting multiplicities by which i mean so supposing you take the number 12 the number of prime factors for 12 is 
it's two and three. I mean, so technically it is two squared times three, but I don't count the fact that two appears twice in the prime factorization. I'm only counting the number of distinct prime factors it has. So uh, what this is saying is, okay, there is an infinite set such that you take the sum of any two numbers of that set, that sum has an even number of prime factors. Now, one thing is, of course, you can imagine uh, trying to build this set one element after another, bit by bit, you know, so to speak. But you don't, it's not clear whether if you're stuck at some place, whether it was because your immediate choice that you made was a bad choice or you the first element that you picked was a bad choice. Or if, supposing you don't encounter any first hundred terms, does it mean you can still continue or do you understand what the problem is? It's, I, in my opinion, this is somewhat intriguing. As in, how would you go about trying to solve this? Why is a statement like this true at all in the first place? Okay. Is the question clear to everybody? Okay. So now let me come to the second one. The second question is slightly more uh, classical. Show that for any n, at least two, the equation has non-trivial solutions. Integral solutions. Now, if I stop the sentence here, of course, you know it is not true because n greater than or equal three. This is the Fermat equation, and of course, then I'm claiming something which is uh, the exact opposite of the statement of Fermat's last theorem. Which is, if you look at this equation over a finite field, that is, if you took look at this modulo p for a prime p, the, the claim is that uh, this equation has has does have non-trivial solutions. Now, what does okay? First of all, what do we understand by what is non-trivial in this context? To say that a solution is non-trivial means none of x, y, and z should be zero. And so here, when I say zero, I mean zero mod p, which means it should not be divisible by p, right? So because of course, if you if one of x or y is zero, then x equals z is, is a trivial solution to this equation anyway. So when we say non-trivial, we just mean that with all three of them being non-zero, and here non-zero mod p. Now there's a reason why this statement is uh, is an important one, and also why it illustrates why Fermat's last theorem is a deep statement. You see, because supposing you are trying to think of, you know, supposing you, somebody is ambitious and says, okay, I want to try to solve Fermat's last theorem, but in an elementary way, because after all, it's the statement doesn't seem to require any of the very big ingredients that are there in the actual proof now. Why can't we do it in a simple way? Because the statement doesn't require anything other than very simple things that we can understand easily. So one of the simplest ways you try and say, okay, maybe, I can show that this equation has uh, no solutions modulo p for some prime p. Now, if you show that it has no solutions modulo p for a prime p, that is for a single prime p, that is not good enough. Why? Because see, if, if there is no solution, no non-trivial solution modulo a prime p, it simply means that at least one of x, y, and z must be divisible by p, right? But so if you want to show Fermat's last theorem in this manner, you want to then show that there is an infinite sequence of primes such that for that infinite, infinite sequence of primes, there is no solution for this equation modulo p. Is that making sense? The only way if you want to, because showing that it, there, is, there are no solutions for a single prime is not good enough. But if you can show that there is an infinite sequence such that with respect to that sequence, for none of the primes in that sequence, this equation has a non-trivial solution, then that's good enough. This statement, which is actually 
a theorem due to Isai Shur. tells you that that hope is not valid. You cannot hope to prove it that way. Because these equations always have solutions for all sufficiently large prime speed. Um, sir. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So how are we going to define that infinite sequence of primes? No, no. So here is the thing. The statement is the following. That Look at, so fix an n, okay? Look at x power n plus y power n equals z power n. And take, uh, you can look at this equation over a prime p. The statement says for p sufficiently large, and we will, I'll tell you what that sufficiently large is when we come to the proof. But at the moment you can think of, given any n, there is a p which depends only on n, a p naught that depends only on n, such that for all primes p greater than or equal to p naught n, the equation x power n plus y power n equals z power n, has non-trivial solutions modulo p. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Nir Niranjan, I uh, just wanted to ask you, I think you already mentioned, what do you mean by sufficiently large prime? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will, I will, so yeah, yeah that's a oh, good okay, 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 So I will, I will maybe write it again explicitly. Okay. So yeah, so what I will do is, uh, yeah, I'll mention this here. So that is, there exists p naught which depends only on n this n is fixed such that for all p greater than or equal p naught p prime the equation let me call this star admits non trivial solutions This is, this is due to Isai Shur uh, over a century ago. Okay, so that is problem number two. Now, the, the third problem is exactly where one of my personal favorite mathematical heroes, Paul Erdish, uh, gets into this frame. And uh, this was motivated by when he was working, when he was studying something with his friend. Uh, George Shekris and uh, Shekris's girlfriend then and then later wife Esther Klein she had made a certain observation that so I'll start with this so Esther Klein made the following observations so when I say points in general position so points in general position in the plane this basically means uh, this is the by this I mean means no three points are collinear So you just have a set of points on the on the plane, you know, the usual Euclidean plane, such that no three points are collinear. So for instance, here is a, you know, you can think of, maybe I've drawn, hopefully I've not drawn any three of them collinear. And if you randomly toss points, it's not going to happen anyway. So here is a six, six uh, put six points on the plane. Esther Klein observed the following two interesting things that one, for any five points, in general position, this is my sh short form for general position. Some four of them form the vertices of a regular foregone, a regular quadrilateral. Right? Now this is a rather straightforward, easy observation, and it's something like this. So if you just put some, 
you see if you can it this is not true with just four points because you see i could have had four points like this now these are not the vertices of a regular quadrilateral but if i put a fifth point anywhere right you will see four vertices that are the vertices of a convex quadrilateral of a regular so not regular i mean convex so everybody i mean this is basic uh, geometry terminology everybody i suppose knows what convex quadrilaterals are right so convex bodies of course you take uh, any two points in uh, in a convex set then the line segment joining that those two points is entirely inside that set so for instance in this picture you know here are this is a convex four bar uh, she made the other slightly this is an almost trivial observation there's nothing here uh, the slightly more non trivial observation was for any nine points in general position there are the vertices of a convex pentagon that is if i take any nine points in in general position on the plane you can find a ray, a convex pentagon a convex uh, you know five gone let me call it that way okay so the question that she asked was is it true in general that is so the question is for any n is there a function n of n a finite number such that for any n of n points in general position there are the vertices of a convex n gone is the question making sense i mean so this is basically esther klein's observation was for n equals 4 and n equals 5 this function n of n is sort of known i mean she she actually made these observations and it anyway to add here's another point for there are i mean the statement the second statement that i wrote down here is not true for eight points that is there are configurations of eight points in general position such that you cannot find a convex pentagon among them okay so and it it turns out so the answer here is again this is in 1930s 1934 the addition shekris n of n exists that is to answer sir client's question yes it is indeed true that there is such an n of n okay now there is something uh, there is a connective tissue between these three point problems again the first one is like a is like an arbitrary statement you know which is somewhat i don't know recreational it's it's peculiar maybe in some sense i don't know how else to describe it the second one has roots with uh, has origins in some sense in fermat's last theorem and the third one is a problem about uh, is a combinatorial problem about uh, some things in nuclear in euclidean geometry so it is a combinatorial geometric problem so to speak and uh, So what is connective about all these three things is basically uh, what i had put in my uh i mentioned in my abstract in the title which is that a very a very general theme in combinatorics which goes by the general idea that so let's say the common theme to all these three problems is basically what was complete disorder is impossible now of course you should be 
I mean, at this level, this sounds like a philosophical statement, and you know, if you have to interpret such things correctly, because see, I can't. For instance, the following obvious question. I mean, I can. The following state statement I'm going to make is obviously false. Any set of an infinite set of integers contains at least one even integer. Of course, this is patently false. So, supposing I decide that you know even integers are order and odd integers are disorder. Then you just say, but you said complete disorder is impossible, but it is possible. It, it's so as I said, it is a more general philosophical theme. But uh, the the way to implement understand this is that there are many things that occur mathematically simply because there are there is a very large set of points, and so certain things can happen. Now let's cut this to some other a later point. So I'll I'll keep I'll come back to these three points, these three questions, and uh, before. We finish this talk. I will show you the proofs of all these three, at least one proof for each of these three statements. But uh, let me come back to this again. So, sometime around the 1920s, apparently, and this was somewhere in Hungary, uh, there was some, uh, I, I think, some sociological experiment or something, you know, and uh, small kids. In some study groups and you know in the nursery groups, they were put into small groups and so on to see how they would play with each other and so on. And uh, one of the people who was actually one of the women who was actually overseeing everything, she seemed to notice that so the students were put in the kids were all put in groups of six. So these were all kids of the age between five to eight or some such thing, and they were randomly put into groups of six each so that they would play because you know they had to share their toys and whatever. And uh, one of the women who was uh, observing, I mean, she was a sociology student and she was observing the kids. She noticed that in each of these groups, there were either three of these kids who seemed to know each other and who were friends with each other, or three of them who just did not talk to each other at all. Okay. Now, under normal circumstances, a person observes this kind of thing they become extremely excited they think you know they have stumbled upon some deep fact about human beings and about kids because after all these are only children they also behave in this particular way so something about the human psych psychological condition has been discovered and so on and so forth but to her credit she realized that it is probably a mathematical phenomenon and has nothing to do with human beings so what she noticed is that uh, this at least this version of the statement is much more popular many people know it but in any case i'll tell you this so here is a i'll write this as a simple proposition among a set of six people some three are mutually acquainted or some three are mutually non acquainted so we basically mean so there are some three people who sort of know each other and so here i'm thinking of knowing as okay if i know you then you know me okay right? uh some people lose friendship instead of acquaintance but uh, you know in real life it can happen that you you think somebody is your friend but they don't think of you as your friend so i don't want to get into this uh, uh, you know uh, controversy of any sort but acquaintance is usually much more neutral right? so if i am acquainted with you you are also acquainted with me it's more anyway one way to understand this proposition and the simple proof goes this way i will just show you a, a pictorial proof so you think of these six people as six vertices now all of you have familiarity with graphs with graph basic graph theory in some form or the other among the students uh anybody wants to tell me any of the students want to volunteer have you seen any graph theory or anything of that sort i mean i'm not going to assume anything much i just want to know 
how much of the terminology you are familiar with yes sir they know basic, oh, they know basic theory. Okay, great. All right. yeah. All right. sure thanks no sir. okay very good so 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 here so you can think of it as a graph so six people so you think of six vertices and let me do the following so if two people are you know they are acquainted then i'll color it with the red edge i'll color that edge red and if they are not acquainted then i'll color it blue let's say okay now what happens is so let's take this particular fellow's perspective so this guy's guy number 1 there are five other people okay so with these five other people he has either acquaintances or non acquaintances which means now let's think if in terms of red and blue edges so every edge in this graph in this complete graph is going to get colored red or blue red if those two people know each other blue if they don't know each other okay now since there are five other people for this guy and there are only two possible colors for each of the edges some three of these edges that come out of here must get the same color right that is just the pigeon hole principle correct so let's assume that it is red so supposing these three edges are red okay okay great now what you do is you now go to the you, you put your focus on these three guys let me call them a b c now if among a b c there is a red edge then we are done right because then there is a there are those three people that one supposing b and c is connected by a red edge red edge then one b c all three of them know each other so if among these three at least one of them is red no problem if not all three of these edges have to be blue and there in front of your eyes are three people a b c who are mutually non acquainted and that's the proof so i am just going to say proof this picture there is nothing more than this in fact this statement can be very easily generalized as as the following so what we will do is i'll just write down a definition so definition given integers k and l say positive integers r k l is the minimum integer n such that let me not write it as a this thing that is the minimum integer n such that if all the edges of the complete graph are colored red or blue then either there is a red complete graph on k vertices or a blue complete graph on l vertices of course this definition is making an assumption that such a minimum exists so so here is my proposition proposition r k l as defined above is always finite and furthermore let's see how will it, before i come to what a relation should be let's think of it the, the idea is going to be exactly the same thing what we will simply do is induction which is to say supposing i want to show that this number is finite now how what is the best way to do it so let's go back to this particular picture supposing you fix your favorite uh, point okay 
and now here are all the other points now out of this there are red edges and blue edges so let's see supposing all these are red edges and all these are blue edges okay now like before all we have to do is the following if this part so you want to just think of it inductively i want to show that there is an rkl what does it mean it means that there must be k vertices such that all edges between those k vertices are colored red so if i can find k minus 1 vertices here such that all edges among them are red then that along with this guy will give you a red that will give you k vertices such that all edges among them are colored red okay if not the other thing to do is you want to find if you can find l minus 1 vertices here right such that all these are blue then again you are through but of course the problem is there may be no such l there may be no l minus 1 vertices here in this part such that all of them are colored blue so inductively the trick is this if either you already have a large enough red collection here or a large enough blue collection here then you are either done in the first half or in the second half or along with this extra point that i have isolated out you can get what you want uh did was my explanation um, did it did it make sense or was it too fast or whatever because i can write out the proof but i don't want to write out everything formally it's much easier to give you pictures and give you an idea of what this is was my argument clear i'll just say it once again pick a vertex look at all edges there are some number of red edges and some number of blue edges okay so if among the red edges if you take the set of all guys that have red edges if among that set of vertices either you are already done or you can get k minus 1 vertices with a red k sub k minus 1 over there then you are through or among all the edges from here that are adjacent with blue guys you have a blue l minus 1 or a red so so let me just write down what i'm saying so in other words what we are saying is if you pick that is so that i'll just give a sketch of proof proof take n to be this which is finite by induction on k plus l if you want okay then the claim is let this vertex take this one word vertex separately then note that let me move this picture away okay note that uh, either a vertex 1 has at least r k minus 1 l neighbors uh, adjacent with red edges or at least r k l minus 1 neighbors adjacent by blue edges now induct that's the idea of the proof uh, so at this point any questions uh, any comments any uh, anything for clarification is it okay
All right. So let me just assume that this works fine. Now, this of this proof, actually, this proposition was actually made by Aldish and Shikris, and uh, they also noticed. So let me write this as a theorem. They notice that in fact, this particular number here is bounded above by this binomial coefficient. How? It's rather straightforward. You know, you see, what is uh, for k equals two? What is this? No, not k equals two. For l equals two, what exactly is this? This is saying, how many vertices do you need such that if you color all the edges, either red or blue, either you will get a, a set of k vertices such that all edges between them are colored red, or some two vertices whose, such that the edge between them is colored blue. Any, any takers, any guesses for this? You see, if you take k vertices, okay, and color all the edges between those k vertices, either red or blue, either you have colored every edge as red, in which case you are through, or you put at least one blue edge, in which case you are through. Is that making sense? Similarly, This is precisely just this. And now what they simply noticed is these two numbers are basically just this. So note that k plus 2 minus 2 choose k minus 1 is k. Similarly, 2 plus l minus 2 choose is also l. So basically, these two equalities, which are trivially true, satisfy equality here and then you notice that these binomial coefficients satisfy this recurrence so if i call this if i give this name give this a name And so just the fact that the binomial coefficient satisfies this very simple inequality tells you that you have a very simple, nice bound like this. Okay. So in particular, what we know is well, what is supposing you plug three and three. So in particular, what we know is so R33 is precisely this point I talked about, this, this first problem here. Uh, R33, this says is at most. 6 minus 2 is 4, choose 2, which is 6. On the other hand, here is a simple picture that you can do. Supposing I take 5 vertices, I can color so here are 5 vertices with the edges colored in this fashion and you see that uh, there is no monochromatic triangle here. There is no red triangle or blue triangle here. As you know, as vertices in graphs. So when I'm saying triangle, I mean, you know, you can't say that this is a triangle because these two are not vertices. The vertices are only these. Right? So this implies that R33 is 6. Okay, this is now here. Let me tell you some other known numbers, some other.
so these are called ramsey numbers this r r stands for ramsey uh and this of course was this theorem uh this theorem as well as this particular proposition were both by addition shekris so where is ramsey coming here who is ramsey kon hai and where where did he come from i'll come to that in just a second but soon let's see some other known ramsey numbers surprisingly not many are known so here is r44 is known to be 18 what does this mean it means that if i take any set of if you take a graph take the complete graph on 18 vertices and you color the edges of that complete graph in any way you want using one of two colors red or blue okay and no matter how you color the edges using red or blue some four vertices are there such that all the edges between those four are red or all four all edges between them are blue that's what this statement means okay let me write down something else here r45 is 25 this means okay you take any 25 vertices take a take the complete graph on 25 vertices and color the edges using red or blue in any way you want either there are some four vertices such that all edges between them are red or there are some five vertices such that all edges between them are blue now the fact that you have equality means the same statement same the first statement with 18 replaced by 17 is not true meaning there is a way to color the edges of the complete graph on 17 vertices using two colors red and blue such that you will not find any four vertices such that all of all edges between them are the same color there is such a coloring that is possible that's what it means same way for r45 equals 25 the corresponding statement saying that with 24 vertices it is not true there is a coloring with 24 that satisfies you know that you cannot find these large you know uniformly colored subgraphs you know complete subgraphs within them now here beyond this everything else is only a bound so r46 is known to be one of these numbers it's between 35 and 41 similarly r55 is known to be between 43 and 49 and r56 is known to be somewhere between 58 and 87 as you can see uh this these gaps seem somewhat small but this gap has jumped up quite a bit right compared to this this is only a gap of 6 but this gap is uh is 30 29 actually it's it's, a, it's almost a 30 gap it's, it's a pretty big gap if you think about it now of course to show that a, a ramsey number has a certain lower bound means you must show a coloring for which you know you cannot find these small subgraphs and so on all right so at this point any questions okay so let me proceed now at this point addition checkers notice something even more general about the proof you see the induction proof here is is so simple basically what you do you start out with the vertex you see how all the edges going out of that you know how uh, they cut your remaining vertices into two parts and now you see how the edges between them in each of these parts how it works and uh, you just stick these two together and you get your induction argument complete so actually what they noticed is that this argument gives something even more general so let me make you uh, let me make another definition these are what are called the higher order ramsey numbers
so first uh, so supposing r is at least 2 and k l at least r are integers okay so r r k l is the minimum n such that now again now what is it you are going to do earlier we were only coloring edges of the graph now we are going to think of this in terms of hypergraphs so again have you have you seen what are, what is a hypergraph or any definition of that sort if not i will not use the terminology have you come across the word hypergraph in in what you have studied so far okay somebody saying all right so it doesn't matter and um, so now what you do one way to think about what we did earlier was you were coloring all the two element subsets okay coloring edges is simply the same as coloring two element subsets now instead of coloring two element subsets we'll think of coloring r element subsets suppose such that if all the r subsets oops if all the r subsets of uh, 1 to n this is my notation for 1 to n are colored red or blue then there exists a set k of cardinality k such that every r subset of k is colored red or a set l with cardinality l such that every r subset of l is colored blue is this making sense is the definition making sense once again i mean how do we know that such a minimum exists that's a valid question but let's set that the existence of you know the finiteness of such a possible parameter aside for the moment uh is it uh, is the definition making sense i mean what what this definition is trying to do is that uh, is that making sense or is there any clarity that you want here is it clear or uh, yeah so for instance let me just to give you guys a an idea of what i am trying to do here think of it this way so supposing so here's an example supposing i think of n as say 10 and r as 3 and k and l as 4 what this is asking is you color so each three subset of 1 to 10 is colored red or blue okay is either colored red or blue and now what do we want so you can think of say 1 2 3 has color red 1 2 4 has color blue and so on and so forth okay now the question is is there a four subset okay such that every three subset contained inside that so for instance if 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 k is uh, works if so to say that uh, you know this the statement above would be true is if each of these three 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2 3 1 2 4 1 2
one three four two three four are all colored red. Similarly, you can say L as uh, say two five six eight works if all of these so two five six two five eight two six eight five six eight are all colored blue. So of course it's possible that you know for n equals ten this is not true at all. And of course, it. I mean, the more general question is, how do you know that such a number is even finite? But uh, so this is a, a simple proposition. Again, I'm going to write this. So, proposition. This again is due to addition. Shikris. Okay, and uh, this states that. And in fact, now the bound here is going to look a little more ugly. So let me write it out, and then I will explain to you how the bound goes. It's not that it is difficult, but it's it's just a little messier looking. Does it make sense? Let me try to explain what this is. Then I write R R minus one. This is basically like saying, okay, this is the corresponding. So you think of these, this super R here, there, as a, so the usual R K L that I just talked about here. These are when you are coloring edges or just two element subsets. So this just this ordinary R should be thought of as R two. so the usual r k l is actually in this notation it is r2 k l because you are coloring the two element subsets namely the edges using one of two colors this statement this induction state this statement over here says that a bound for this number that you want to define in this state in the definition i made above is given by this large number over here now by induction if you see again like so for this i will write out the proof by induction we induct if you want i'm going to i'm going to sum r this k plus l so the note note that for r for r equals 2 this is just the ramsey numbers r k l which are finite by what we have seen above so now i just want to show you so i'll give you a very simple idea i won't give you a exact proof i will give you a sketch of what it means so supposing we are now thinking of so suppose r equals 3 okay i somehow want to convince you that so you want to show that r3 of kl is finite all right does it make sense yeah uh, again see if anything if i am saying something that does not sound you know clear or is, is lacking clarity or is confusing please feel free to stop me because the it gets i mean what i'm doing here is actually very routine stuff and it will get more interesting only when we get to the questions over there so in this part where you know things are supposed to be routine i don't want you to get confused or fall behind because of the terminology any questions any any doubts
okay great okay so now i want to show you that this is finite what does this mean so again we will do exactly the same thing as before pick one point and it cuts these are the remaining vertices okay this one thing is this plus one so here is a bunch of them and i'm going to assume that it is as many as something like this so i hear what i want to show you is we shall show r3 kl is at most r2 r2 is the usual r r of r3 k minus 1 l r3 k l minus 1 plus 1 now this is what i want to convince you so what i want to say is you take this to be n okay now if this is n this plus 1 corresponds to this particular vertex here v so this remaining part here is this cardinality of this set okay now what does this mean you see three subsets are given colors which means that every three subset which contains v gets a color now that basically means so supposing there are some two vertices here say u and uh, w so we have u v w has color red or blue right supposing it has color red now since u v w has color red you can imagine this inducing a color on this part on this particular edge and making that color red is that making sense yeah so what this basically means is that this triple this triangle was colored red so you take that vertex away it induces since i'm i'm sort of isolating v the color that it induces on uw i'm going to make that as the color red over there and now what basically what this does is it colors all the edges of this particular set red or blue right well of course not uh, any such edge take any edge here so for instance you take any particular edge say ab then the question is you look at abv that has color red or blue if abv was colored red then you color the edge ab you color the edge ab by red if abv was blue you color ab by blue okay and now because the size of this set is precisely this ramsey number then it shows that either you have a red by definition of r say capital k capital l either there is a uh, uh, what say there is a set of size all of whose edges are red or a set of size r3 kl minus 1 all of whose edges are colored blue is that making sense and now here is the thing right so by definition what this means so either so this is basically the point so there is either a k here such that all these edges are red or there is an l over here such that all these edges are blue now what does it mean to say all edges here are red if everything here by the definition this is the size of that block this size here is r3 k minus 1 l by definition this means that either there is a an l subset here all of which are blue or there is a 
k minus 1 subset here all edges among them are red but if there's a k minus 1 subset all edges are red that along with this v will form a k subset all whose three subsets are red or by by the induction there is an l that is that is there's an l subset such that all three subsets of them are already blue as you want uh i may have lost some of you here is it clear what i said any questions is is what i said clear because if it is not i can just repeat this a little bit again yes sir that would be clear it was clear okay great hey, thank you so basically this is the proof and this general statement that i wrote here is exactly the same thing with induction okay exactly the same thing with induction now let me go back to so we will now address problem 3 to the client problem and this is uh, this was paul adish had called this the happy ending theorem and well, he called it happy ending theorem because shortly after they proved this theorem esther klein and shekris got married so according to him it was there was a happy ending it's not happy ending as in they solved the problem completely i'll come to that in just a second so but here is what they did now what this particular thing means so uh klein had already observed so claim was this so what was let's recall what the problem was the problem that was here was well is there a given any n is there a function n of n such that any set of n of n points in general position on the plane contain the vertices of a convex n gon okay and the adish uh, shekris theorem said yes it exists now let me show you a proof and then you will see how it's a somewhat scary claim n of n is less than or equal r4 n5 now first of all what is this right hand side r4 n5 r4 n5 is the size of well the size of a set such that if all four subsets of that are colored red or blue then there must either be an n size set such that all four subsets of that are colored red or there is a five subset whose all four subsets are colored blue does it make sense okay and now how does this proof go this is at this point it's a very simple observation this is just a very beautiful little geometric observation so the main idea is observe if n points satisfy that any four among them form a convex quadrilateral then the n points are the vertices of a convex n-gon you see it's basically something like this if supposing you have let me just show you a picture so if i have if i have some uh, here i put seven vertices Now we have seven vertices which form a convex seven gon. You take any four of them, of course, they will form a convex quadrilateral. That's by definition. 
Now, supposing if it were not the case that they formed a convex uh, quadrilateral, which is to say, supposing one of them were inside, the main trick is that you can basically do what is called a triangulation. Now, the way I've drawn this, it looks like it is on the diagonal. So let me move this a little somewhere. Now, if you triangulate it, then you see this point on the inside must lie in one of those triangles. Correct? But the moment it lies in one of those triangles, here are four points such that these four do not form a convex quadrilateral. Okay, so the point is if here's a very simple sufficient condition to check when n points are the vertices of a convex n gone, which is every four of them must form a convex quadrilateral. If and only if. Okay, now keeping this in mind, what addition checklist do is the following. Take n to be this large, this number. Now I'll tell you in a little while how large this, this is going to be. But what this means is okay. And take, oops, sorry. Color, take n this and consider a set of n points. n points in general position in the plane. Okay. Now what we do is, of course, since this is a Ramsey number, it needs some coloring. So what is it you're going to do? Color a four set of these points red if they form a convex foreground and color them, color that four set, color not them, color the four set blue if it does not form. Convex foreground. All right. So every four subset of this set of n points has been colored red or blue. What? But by definition, n is this number. So what does it mean? So by definition, by definition, either. There are n points such that every four set, four subset among them are colored red. Or a five set such that every four point every four subset of those five points are colored blue does it make sense now if it is the first then we are done because see this is just the observation we made you've got an n points such that every four subset among them are colored red. What does red? Red means that those four points on the plane form a convex foreground. And what we just observed is that if you have n points such that every four subset among them forms a convex n convex quadrilateral, then those n points must be the vertices of a convex n gon. So if the first situation is true, that is, if you can get n points such that every four subset is colored red, we are through. What does it mean to say the other thing happens? Which means the second situation says that there is a set of five points such that every four subset among them 
is colored blue what does this mean it means there is a set of five points such that every four among them is not a convex quadrilateral but that is not possible because of klein's first observation among any five points in general position some four of them will always be the vertices of a convex quadrilateral so you cannot get five points on the plane such that every four of them is a, is not a convex quadrilateral so the second so by klein's observation the second scenario is not possible and the first scenario gives us what we want is it okay any questions okay does it make sense now of course there is something about this and uh, if you're wondering this is a bunch of symbols how large is it as a number right after all this is a good question so first i want to tell you is this this number is horribly large now what do you mean what do i mean by horribly large now let's go back to klein's observation over here which i made in the very beginning klein noticed that uh, any nine points you can get a convex pentagon right so if i want to take n equals 5 this is what we want so for n equals 5 klein's result says nine points suffice what does this give what however is r 4 5 5 can we give a bound for r455 see the problem is we don't know what the number exactly is we just know upper bounds for this but let's see how bad an upper bound is okay i said as before r455 is less than or equal r3 54 oh, sorry r3 of r454 R four four five plus one. This is just the recurrence that I wrote before. Okay. Now this is an easy question again. What is R four of five four? This is how many points do you need such that if you color every four subset, either there are five points such that every four subset among them is colored red, or some four subset is colored blue. So this is actually simply five. for the same reason as why we have the corresponding result for r k 2 to be k similarly okay so what let's put that thing over here so these are both 5 okay great Okay, so far it looks nice now how do we compute this again let's go this is r 2 of r 3 r 3 4 5 plus 1 plus 1 so that's plus 2 okay now r 3 r r 2 is a usual r the usual ramsey number what is this r 3 business r 3 of 5 4 is at most r of r3 of 4 4 or 
r3 of 5 3 plus 1 okay so now again r3 of 5 3 is simply 5 so this is r of r3 4 4 5 plus 1 okay now can we compute what is r3 of 4 4 r3 of 4 4 is again r of r3 of 4 3 r3 of 3 4 plus 1 now this guy again here these are both 4 now in case if you're worrying i'm if i'm writing things too fast don't worry if i i can make this available to you later and then you can see i just don't want to spend too much time working them through because you know it will just take more time and i now we know that r of 4 4 is 18 so this is 19 okay so this guy here is 19 so r of 19 5 plus 1 now r of 19 5 just i'm just doing some routine calculations this is at most 19 plus 5 is 23 so 21 choose 4 which is uh, Well, so you see, this is uh, five. This is three. So basically, uh, this is some pretty big number. Uh, let me just see how much this is. And I'm, I'm I'm just doing this calculation just to show you. See, I mean, of course, it looks like I'm wasting my time doing all these useless calculations here. But uh, I want to show you this for a very specific purpose. Um, so it turns out this is something like 5,985. That is this. So you put one more. So plus one is 5,986. Okay. So what is this number over here? This, this guy over here is this whole thing over here is, uh, this guy over here is like 5986 so this so r3 of 54 is 5987 okay that is this this, this so this is my r3 of 54 dump this number here Which means, if I ignore all these calculations here, this is of the order eleven thousand over, uh, I think. So if, if you look at this particular thing, this will be easily of the order 2 to the power 10,000. This will be at least 2 to the power 10,000. What that tells you is the bound I got for an answer of 9, the bound this gives you is 2 to the power 10,000. Now, do you know how large 2 to the power 10,000 is? Any ideas? I mean, of course, you can say 2 to the power 10,000 is a large number. Try to tell, let me tell you what it is in terms of relatable phenomenon, okay? Take the age of the universe, as we know since the Big Bang, which is something like close to 14 billion years, right? Write this age in nanoseconds. Nanosecond is 10 to the minus 9 seconds. If you write the age of the universe in nanoseconds, now nanoseconds is basically how fast our most fast supercomputers can perform calculations. If you write the age of the universe in nanoseconds, 
that number will not make a dent in 2 to the power 10000 it won't even be a a small fraction of 2 to the power 10000 so the actual answer is 9 the bound that erdish and shekhar is gave is 2 to the power 10000 so it's not it's not a satisfactory number at all so this bound so clearly this bound is horrendous and one needs better bounds but i will not go into that so there is it is still a part of open research about what this particular thing means so what does it mean to say that uh, you can get what are the best bounds known here how much better can you do and so on these are uh, so the best bounds are still we know a reasonably good amount as of today but it's still nowhere close to optimum and uh, of course the bound that is here is is terrible and much better bounds are known but i will not say anything more about this as far as problem number 3 is concerned uh a quick question before i move ahead how much more time do i have oh, so you can have uh, 10 to 15 more minutes if you want okay 10 to 15 okay i think i will take i i may not be able to let me see how much i can tell you then about uh, the other two problems so the for the second problem so here is another generalization of is by allowing many colors so for instance here again i'm going to make a definition suppose k1 k2 kr are all positive integers okay r k1 k2 kr is the minimum n such that if the all the edges of the complete graph on n vertices are colored using colors numbered 1 2 r some r colors okay then either there is a k k1 colored by colored 1 or k k2 colored by color 2 or and so on k k r colored by color r is that making sense so for instance if r is 3 uh if i say example so example if i take r 3 3 3 what does this mean if this is the number n this means that if you take the edges of that is all edges of kn are colored red blue or green then there is a triangle see all are 3 3 3 so either there is a red triangle or a blue triangle or a green triangle that's what this means so once again the theorem Okay, in in the same paper of addition shekris and again the proof is identical so i'm not going to tell you how to go about this or any k1 k2 kr r k1 k2 kr is finite what this means is 
you see using only two colors is not really a restriction you could have picked any set a finite set of colors and if all the edges are colored using one of those r colors a similar structural statement is also true okay the proof of this also goes exactly by the same kind of induction now we will be inducting on summation k1 plus k2 plus kr okay now i come to problem 2 which is the theorem of isai sure so what exactly do we want to do here we are looking at uh, we are coloring all the elements of fp and it's so not coloring we are looking at we are looking at uh, x to the power n plus y power n equals z power n modulo p fix n and we want to say this has non trivial solutions okay now everybody here is uh, comfortable with finite fields see if you take arithmetic modulo p for a prime p you would look at additions and multiplication modulo p then you know that 1 2 p forms a finite field right everybody is comfortable with that notion sir msc students yes will know that msc we'll students know will know that okay okay so that that's all i just want to know so what we what it means is so there's one very simple fact about finite fields note that so note that the multiplicative group so if i use zp right zp star which is the multiplicative group in zp minus 0 right is actually cyclic and suppose some theta is a generator which is to say that zp star is generated by theta now if you want me to be very concrete see you can think of say if p is 11 you can figure out which is the i think 2 will be a generator actually for that is you take just the powers of 2 you will get everything modulo 11 so on and so forth okay so first thing in this particular question is okay you are looking at x power n plus y power n equals z power n first consider suppose n and p minus 1 are relatively prime okay then note that uh, in zp star which is the multiplicative group the map x going to x power n is an injective homomorphism which is to say every element if n is relatively prime to p minus 1 then every element is actually a fourth power is it will be an nth power that is every element of zp star is in fact an nth power so in this case there is nothing to prove am i making sense see think of n as fixed and now you think of any prime p if it turns out that n and p minus 1 are relatively prime so for instance you think of p as 4 no not as 4 supposing p is n is 5 and uh, you think of uh, p as say 17 So seventeen minus one, sixteen and five are relatively prime. So in modulo, uh, you know, modulo seventeen. If you take the non-zero elements, that is in the finite field on 
17 elements and you take its multiplicative group every element is a fifth power so this when you write x power n plus y power n equals z power n it is trivially true because it trivially admits solutions because supposing you take 2 plus 3 equals 5 2 is a fifth power of something 3 is a fifth power of something 5 is also a fifth power of something so this equation happens to be true always the problem arises when n and p minus 1 are not relatively prime so the non trivial case okay so once again instead of trying to give you all the details of the proof i will illustrate how it works so let's pick some uh, supposing so for ela or simplicity let uh, say n be 5 for illustrative purposes okay so if n is 5 basically and I'm, i mean p is something which must be 1 mod 5 so you know p could be 31 or you know 61 or 101 or some such thing right we just need that n and p minus 1 are not relatively prime so now what happens is since uh say p must be say 1 mod 5 every element in zp star uh is of the form theta to the power phi k plus l where zero is less than or equal to less than phi right because after all you see the theta is the generator for zp star so every element can be written as a power of theta you just separate out the powers of phi so those that are powers of there are perfect fifth powers those whose powers is 1 mod 5 those whose powers are 2 mod 5 and so on and so forth okay now here is a really interesting trick so uh so supposing for i less than j color the edge i j by the by the color so by the color r if j minus i is theta to the power 5 something plus r now this looks like if i say it, if i write it in this formal fashion it looks very complicated but the basic idea is very simple you see as if as i said as an illustrative example suppose so if p if p were 101 then you know as i said every element every element is a fifth power so it is like theta to the power 5 theta to the 10 dot, dot 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 there are these elements or theta theta to the 6 so this would be one mod which means it will be 96 right or theta square theta to the 7 theta to the 97 so all these are like these are all fifth powers the powers of all these are 1 mod 5 the powers of all these are 2 mod 5 powers of all these will be 3 mod 5 and the powers of all these are 4 mod 5 okay so what you do now is you pick any i and j in fp and supposing i is less than j you put a coloring on fp on zp in the following fashion so here is i here is j i less than j you color this by so you look at j minus i now j minus i is an element it's a non zero element so it must be theta power something now if that something is one of these numbers you color it zero if it is color here it is color it 1 2 3 and 4 is the coloring making sense yeah now the basic idea is because so now you use about five colors so if p is greater than r 
three, 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 three. Then we are done. What does this mean? This number by definition means no matter how you color the edges, there must be a monochromatic triangle. Okay. What does this particular thing means? That is, there exists, there exists i j k such that i j j k i k are all the same color say color 3 what does this mean it means that j minus i must be theta to the power 5 uh, something plus 3 k minus j must be theta to the power some 5 again plus 3 and also k minus i must be theta to the power 5 something plus 3 right that's what these colors being the same mean and the color being 3 means but now notice that this plus this j minus i plus k minus j is precisely k minus i so in particular so if I call this A, if I call this B, I call this C, theta to the power 5A plus 3 plus theta to the power 5B plus 3 plus theta to the power 5C plus 3. Now, because now you divide throughout by theta cube, And that is uh, that is exactly what we wanted. If you if you go to the statement of the theorem, that's exactly. It. The interesting thing here is this happens not for number theoretic reasons, but for combinatorial reasons. Okay. Now I think well, the time is twelve forty, uh, and uh, I think I'm done with my time. So I won't be able to tell you much about the first question. Uh, but, uh, but maybe at this point I will stop and if anybody has any questions uh, or any comments or anything, I can, I think I will stop at this point. Thank you.